All right. Oops. So you guys are seeing the correct screen, right? This looks good. Yep. All right. Wait, it was, so, but now we see. Now we see the presenter view. Now you see presenter view. This changed something. Man. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks so much. All right, so it's my, my pleasure to welcome everybody to the, the Taylor White Seminar. Um, and I'm gonna give a little introduction to this seminar series in general. So the Taylor White Seminar uh, honors a scientific collaboration between our professor John Taylor and Tom White that has spanned four decades. Uh, it began in 1982 when uh, John Taylor invited Tom White to Berkeley to present his research at CETUS. Uh, and then that flowered in 1988 when Tom took a sabbatical uh, here at Berkeley. And during that sabbatical, um, he did some work which led to a little publication that some of you might be familiar with. It included Tom Bruns, Steve Lee, and John Taylor, of course, on PCR and fungi that now has more than 34,000 citations. So this is the famous ITS paper, which is what is commonly used to identify fungi now. Um, among other things. Uh, so this also led to two decades of collaborative NIH-supported research on fungi that cause human disease. And next slide. So in 2013, Tom White was selected to present uh, the UCB Regents Lecture, um, which you can see here. And the success of that Regents Lecture spawned the Taylor White Seminar Series. And so we've had several notable mycologists come through this seminar series, which are listed here. James Anderson, Lynn Boddy, Regina Common, David Hibbett, Paolo Bonfante, and Nancy Keller, Matt Fisher, and Redis was supposed to talk to us last year, but thanks to the pandemic, we get to see him this year. And with that, I will hand over to John, who's gonna introduce Redis. So it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Ritas Vugalis one year late due to COVID. And <clears throat> Ritas, um, this is a photo of Ritas and his wife Liz and their first child, um, probably when he was a PhD student at uh, VPI. He'd gotten a master's there and he'd gotten his uh, bachelor's at the State University of New York um, before that. And then um, before becoming a professor at Duke, Ritas did a one year um, postdoc at the USDA's um, mycology lab um, in uh, Bethesda. And here is a picture of Ritas um, after he was a professor at Duke with his mentor, Orson Miller from VPI. And Ritas has won all the awards that you can win from the Mycological Society of America, the Alex Zopoulos Prize for a Young Mycologist, um, Fellow of the Society, and then the Distinguished Mycologist Award. And he's also um, been elected a, a Fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology. And he, he is a mycologist with a true international reputation. Here he is with the late Nick Reed. Um, at an International Mycological Congress in Edinburgh. And Redis is a pioneer in the field of both um, fungal molecular systematics and fungal ecology, as we will hear, hear today in his talk on genetics of fungal colonization associated with global exotic forestry, insights from pines and their symbiotic mycorrhizal fungi. And with that, take it away, Redis. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, so I just want to start by saying uh, it's a real honor, uh, and it's really great to see many of you. Uh, it's been a tough year. Uh, we miss each other. Uh, what a great community we're part of. So I'm going to go ahead and start with my first slide. Here we go. Let's see if I can get this to go right in the start here. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, that's good. yeah, so, so this is a photograph of uh, some Monterey pines in Australia. Uh, and these are some of the very first uh, pine trees planted into a plantation 
uh, in Australia back in 1870. They're still alive. Uh, some of them are, are dying and some of them are uh, actually maybe even bigger than the Monterey pines that grow in California. Uh, but that was an experiment that the Australians started uh, back in the 19th century uh, when they realized that they needed faster growing trees. And, and so uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. My sort of entree into this project that I'm gonna describe uh, started with a collaboration with Tom and John and Kabir and uh, our postdocs at the time, Jenny, Sonny, Sarah, and others, all of whom are now uh, assistant professors. Uh, and that project was looking at the uh, fungal communities associated with pines across North America. Of course, this is one of our sort of the uh, major radiations uh, of the pine AC. It, it uh, also deals with the origins of ec uh, ectomycorrhizal symbioses, the pine AC uh, were the first plants and also uh, uh, sort of led to what I'm gonna talk about today. So uh, these are not just some cute animals, uh, all of the organisms in this photograph on, on the slide here are ones that were introduced at different times to uh, Australia and other continents, uh, including pines shown in the upper right. And so here's a, a map uh, taken off of uh, iNaturalist Atlas of Living Australia. Uh, you can see that pine trees uh, have been introduced all over the world and pretty much anywhere they'll grow. In fact, pines are, uh, they follow humans. They're uh, a good example of a synantrophic uh, association with humans. Uh, so our, our interest in, in pines, of course, is, is that they are uh, associated almost exclusively with ectomycorrhizal fungal communities. And so I just wanna give you a little bit of background. Uh, EM fungi are the major guild of symbiotic fungi occurring with roots of many forest trees and particularly pines. Uh, we know that mycorrhizal fungi are involved in uh, exchanging uh, nutrients, particularly organic nitrogen, uh, but also phosphorus. And uh, in exchange, they receive photosynthates from their plant host. In terms of EM fungi, we also know that uh, these fungi have, these, this guild has evolved over 80 times in different lineages. Uh, and those include ascomycetes as well as basidiomycetes uh, and even a former member of the, uh, member of the former zygomycota. Uh, many of these EM fungi also exhibit host preference for certain different groups of, of tree species. And in particular, the pinaceae are known to harbor, uh, associate with with a couple of uh, fungi exclusively, such as Rhizopogon and Suillus. And I'll talk a little bit about those today. So just to give you a, a quick sort of summary of the history of plantation forestry with pines. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, people have been carrying pine seeds and pine trees with them uh, from the earliest days of colonization. And, but most of those early attempts were failures. And it, well, it wasn't until uh, the early part of the uh, 20th century, really, that it became clear that mycorrhizal inoculum is essential, especially for pine trees. Okay, that was work done by Kessel in Australia. Uh, and uh, we've since uh, learned that this inoculation comes from the soil that's introduced with the trees. Uh, and that there's a process of selection that has occurred such that now we have a very exclusive set of exotic fungi introduced with exotic pine plantations. And uh, this has been the study of, of many different, uh, uh, been the uh, topic of uh, interest for many different labs, this topic of linked pine EMF invasions. Uh, uh, Simberloff has 
uh, describe pines as one of the most widespread and potential uh, impactful introductions on earth. And uh, so this was sort of intriguing for me, having worked on the pine system with uh, Tom and John, uh, I wanted to take it down south and uh, study this uh, community uh, in the Southern hemisphere. So uh, over 200 years, but in many cases, barely a hundred years of afforestation uh, associated with the introduction of these EMF communities. And uh, two processes that, that are associated with that are ecological filtering in the broad sense, where the pines, uh, the process of introducing pine plantations resulted in a, a, a relatively depauperate community, sometimes as few as four, sometimes even a single species of ectomycorrhizal fungi associated with pine introductions in different parts of the world. Uh, uh, of course, the pines themselves are highly adapted uh, as well, and so they pretty much can grow anywhere. Uh, we also know that several of these ectomycorrhizal fungi, such as Suillus luteus, Amanita muscaria, and others, uh, have been shown to facilitate the invasion, further escape from plantation by pines and escape into uh, native forests, grasslands, and so forth. And uh, this uh, invasive, this is uh, part of the extended phenotype of pines uh, as invasive species. Uh, I'm gonna also talk today a little bit uh, at the end of my talk about some of these legacy effects uh, but wherever pines have been planted, uh, they have obvious impact on local biodiversity, productivity, and soil biogeochemistry. So uh, this is a uh, sort of uh, cartoon uh, uh, produced by uh, Jason Hoeksma, a paper we just we recently published, uh, describing how we might study these exotic plantations shown here. Uh, as a system for looking at these processes such as ecological filtering, how do, uh, what is the impact of this lower diversity of fungi associated with these exotic plantations? Uh, and uh, also, uh, what is the evolutionary processes uh, uh, occurring within those uh, sort of populations and communities that are isolated away from from their sources. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of interest these days in the escape from plantations uh, resulting in invasive pine fronts, uh, which are not such a big problem in Australia because of the, the uh, low amount of water that's available to them, but, but certainly in other parts of their ranges, uh, invasive pines are a major problem. So I'm gonna talk today uh, about uh, some work that I did during a sabbatical uh, that I took in Australia at Western Sydney University uh, in 2018. Uh, my wife and I, Liz and I, uh, took the opportunity to visit uh, field sites across Australia. And as I mentioned before, many of the original sites of introduction still exist. So it's possible to go in and, and, and survey uh, the fungal diversity associated with pine plantations that were planted uh, over a hundred years ago, as well as current uh, rotation crops of pines. And I'm gonna describe some uh, results of molecular barcoding uh, studies. Uh, we've been able to identify uh, virtually all of the uh, fruiting bodies that are associated with these sites. And then some soil metagenomics work uh, where we've been able to uh, look at these communities. And so I'm just gonna uh, jump into sort of the, the results here and uh, say that, you know, it's quite obvious to anybody who has visited these exotic pine sites that they are dominated by just a handful of mycorrhizal fungi, as you see here. So you have, and I'll talk about these in just a minute here. So how do we know these fungi and who they are? Well through uh, ITS barcoding and other techniques, uh, we can uh, 
not only identify many of these fungi by sites, such as Amanita muscaria shown here, but we can, using ITS sequencing and other molecular markers, uh, identify the specific lineage within the uh, Amanita muscaria species complex uh, that has been widely distributed around the world. So in this case, clade two is defined by Gemmel et al. Uh, other species uh, such as shown here, uh, Lactarius deliciosus again, uh, has a rather uh, broad distribution across the Southern hemisphere, uh, also with pines. You can see it's in South America, uh, Africa, as well as Australia. Uh, and we know that it's a specific lineage uh, linked to uh, other, uh, its European origin. Uh, and uh, quite a few of these species that have been broadly introduced can be recognized by sight by an expert uh, in combination with ITS sequencing. And uh, one of the focal groups has been the genus Suillus. There's a handful of these that have been broadly introduced around uh, the world with, with exotic pines. Uh, and uh, using ITS barcoding, Suillus works really well. You can really nail down the species uh, and we can begin to conjecture uh, where they came from. So in the case of Suillus bovinus, for example, that's clearly a European taxon, doesn't occur anywhere else. Um, and we find the same species in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, another one, Suillus cothernatus here, we know that it's been uh, uh, its native range is Eastern North America, and we find it in only in one region uh, in uh, Queensland, Australia, nowhere else, uh, and so forth. So uh, using this type of approach, this uh, ITS barcoding com in combination with, with uh, morphotaxonomy, uh, we can really begin to tease apart the origins of different fungi that have been co-introduced with pines. And, and uh, a story is beginning to emerge. Uh, two species from California uh, turn out to be very commonly introduced with pines across Australia, uh, especially in New Zealand uh, and other places like uh, 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 Hawaii. Uh, Suillus quiescens, which was described by Tom and his lab group uh, only a few years ago. It's actually qu quite hard to find quiescens in California. It's not that uh, common uh, fruiting uh, when other fungi are abundant. But uh, in Australia, at least, and in New Zealand, uh, it's the number one Suillus species with radiata pines. So we see changes in the local abundance of different mushroom species uh, when they go from their native range where they might be less common to being extremely common and uh, abundant uh, in their exotic ranges. Uh, so similarly, uh, Suillus pungens uh, has been widely introduced in Eastern Australia and New Zealand, but particularly in New Zealand, it's, it's, it's highly abundant and very common. So we can begin with this information to begin conjecture about when and where these different species were introduced. So we, we know that there's some uh, episodes of introduction uh, starting in the uh, 18th century, early European introductions, uh, we know that Suillus luteus and Suillus granulatus appear to have been widely introduced with many different pine species from Europe. Uh, Suillus colonitis, uh, a more sort of restricted distribution. It's rarely found with, with radiata pines, but it is found with other early introductions of stone pines uh, in, in Australia. And only in Australia, we don't find it in New Zealand, for example. So we see, uh, we can begin to conjecture that uh, that uh, Suillus quiescens and pungens must have been part of a sort of a California-based introduction, possibly with radiata pines. Uh, although radiata pines themselves were 
were not directly introduced from California, but but rather from from Q. So that the the route of introduction may not be uh, obvious all the time. But again, because of the strong host associations, uh, it's easier to track these introductions for Suillus. Uh, another mycorrhizal fungus, the uh, false truffle uh, rhizopogon, a uh, little more problematic taxonomically. However, uh, lots of ITS sequencing has allowed us to also nail down uh, the different species of rhizopogon that have been introduced to Australia. And as you can see here, uh, we can also identify where they're likely to have been introduced from, whether it's North America or Europe. And uh, again, in most of these cases, these introductions seem to hail from either Europe or, or, or North America, different parts of North America. So in the course of doing a, a fruiting body survey, uh, we've also been able to nail down the taxonomy of several other mycorrhizal fungi that have been co-introduced with pines, such as Tremelodendron, Clavulina, Tricholoma, and Thalephora. Uh, in all of these instances, however, it almost always seems to be a single species that's highly adaptable and that has been widely dispersed. So even though all of these genera are represented by many species in their native range, it always seems to be just a single taxon that's been introduced. Uh, and one example of such a taxon is the resupinate fungus, Athelia bicolor, probably European origin, although we're still trying to figure that out, uh, which is also one of the more common soil uh, inhabiting uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi. So, so clear evidence for, for widespread introductions, co-introductions. Other fungi, such as the genus Lacaria, one of the common models, uh, this ITS tree here just is, is meant to show that that there is no clear clustering of these Lacaria collections from Australia. You know, that was quite puzzling. But uh, after examining larger numbers of sequences, what, we what we're finding is that the genus Lacaria uh, has a very broad host range. Uh, and so it seems that a lot of the exotic plantations are actually recruiting uh, native species of Lacaria into the pine plantations. Uh, and only a very few uh, of these Lacaria uh, uh, genotypes appear to have a European, or in this case, uh, a North American origin. So I think that's interesting that, that you see both uh, co-dispersal as well as local recruitment of compatible mycorrhizal fungi. So, so using uh, molecular systematics and morphotaxonomy, we can already unambiguously track the origins of uh, about 30 different ectomycorrhizal fungi introduced with exotic pines around the world. And so uh, this is not the first study to do this. Uh, and Elsa and, other, and uh, Ann Pringle, uh, Ian Dickey and others, have identified sort of a, a whole research agenda for how to, uh, how to study these fungi and identify the traits that allow them to spread and invade. Uh, we wanna know how do they compete with native fungi? Uh, do they fill unique niches or do they, uh, do they compete for existing niches with other fungi? Uh, and a whole range of questions here and I won't read them all, uh, except for the last one. And one of the major questions is to know what types of genome changes have enabled some of these ectomycorrhizal fungi to adapt to these new exotic environments. So I'm gonna move on and talk about some uh, meta barcoding work that we did uh, while we were doing our field work across the Southern part of Australia where the, where the pines have been introduced and New Zealand. Uh, we collected soil samples and we, uh, we sort of used a modified protocol from the uh, North American survey. We only took five samples from each plantation. Uh, for every plantation that we surveyed, 
We also uh, tried to survey an adjacent or nearby native forest. Uh, and as uh, opportunity permitted, we also sampled some of the invasive pines that were growing in the vicinity. So here's an example of an Australian radiata pine plantation on the left, uh, growing side by side with a beautiful uh, eucalypt forest. Uh, and so it's very easy to go out and sample and uh, across a transect between those sites. Uh, and here's an example of one of these invasive pines. These are, these are called wildings. Uh, and at least in Australia, these are not a major problem uh, for biodiversity. I mean, they do, they do invade uh, and they, are, they do get eliminated, but they're, they're nothing like what you see in other continents. So uh, uh, right now I'm gonna report just a preliminary report. And this is just based on Australian soils only. Uh, but we've surveyed soils from, uh, from uh, all different continents, uh, particularly uh, New Zealand and South America, uh, looking at the uh, sort of dispersal and uh, spread of these uh, different fungi. So, so uh, the first thing I just want to point is that there's plenty of, of ectomycorrhizal fungi represented in the soil survey that we performed across Australia. And many of these are pine associated fungi. So we know that, that based on, on amplicon sequencing, uh, fungi such as Wilcoxina, a very common mycorrhizal associate, uh, or Inosibi or Rhizopogon are rather common, uh, uh, even in native soils where these fungi have been able to disperse and uh, await for a pine host to come along. So uh, here's a, an NMDS plot showing sort of the variation among the samples that we collected. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of geographic variation among the soil fungal communities. Uh, uh, and this is a plot for just the native forest sites. So these are mostly eucalyptus forests. There's a couple of uh, other uh, families. There's some uh, uh, banksiate. Banksias and so forth uh, from Western Australia, where there's not as many eucalypts. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, it's it's largely a sort of a geographic gradient. As you go from west to east, uh, you see chain gradual change in these communities. If we look at the pine plantation communities, we see much pretty much the same pattern, uh, with you know Western Australia on the left and. Uh, uh, Eastern Australia, Victoria, New South Wales on the right, uh, South Australia, somewhere in between. Uh, when you overlay both of those sets of points, so now we're comparing pine plantations and native plantations, it's, it's just an overlay. There's really no clear pattern. And uh, this suggests that by and large, you know, the native uh, microbial soil community is probably not changed too drastically unless one begins to look at the changes. And when you do that, so this is a uh, result of a, a Permanova test here where, we're, where we compare uh, the pine versus the native planta uh, the plantation versus the native soils. And as you can see in, in every case here, we see a shift. Uh, in the average community composition uh, after the introduction of pines. Maybe not a big surprise, but it does suggest that in fact, uh, there is an impact on native biodiversity. So if we do a uh, further sort of filtering of the data set here uh, using uh, Fungild, we uh, screen out the ectomycorrhizal fungi. And as you can see here, the numbers of EM fungi associated with different soil samples uh, varies from as few as you know one or two species all the way up to uh, 30, but not much more than that. Uh, and so there is a limited number of EM fungi associated with plantations. Overall, as you can see here, uh, the native forest harbors a larger 
number of EM fungi usually than the plantations. But if we now, if we do ordination on the mycorrhizal community only, you see a very different effect. First of all, I want to point out that the native forests represent a relatively narrow range of diversity uh, of their communities. Uh, and uh, as you see here, but the uh, plantation sites uh, vary all over the place. And if you uh, project uh, the species that are contributing to this variation, what we see is that there's quite a bit of variation among the individual samples uh, in terms of uh, which species are driving this, this pattern that we see. So all the green points here are, are pine plantation sites. Uh, and these are the fungi that are generating this, this pattern. Uh, and most of these are pine associated mycorrhizal fungi, not all. Uh, in between, uh, we see that the invasive sites, these, these wilding pines, their communities fall somewhere in between the blue and the green. So another way to explore the data set here is to use a analysis called Metacoder, uh, which takes the numbers of reads for different species and uh, performs a test to see whether or not which groups or lineages are enriched. Uh, and so if you uh, do a metacoder analysis here, and now we're going to compare the pine plantations versus the native forests taken as a whole. Uh, what you see is that certain lineages of fungi emerge as sig being significantly enriched uh, in the pines. Uh, in particular, uh, the Rhizopogon suillus lineage, the suilloid fungi, uh, are highly enriched. And that's no surprise because we know that they're obligately associated with pines. Uh, we also see certain other groups, including uh, several species of Inosibi that are enriched, uh, Thalephora and Tomentella and other members of that lineage, uh, Tylospora and Athelia, as I mentioned earlier. And one surprise was the genus Cystotrema, uh, which is, doesn't get picked up too often, but uh, appears to be consistently associated with pines. Uh, if we do the converse comparison here uh, and ask which fungi are enriched in the native forest relative to the pine plantations, uh, you get a very unsatisfying answer, Agaricales sp. These are sequences that are uh, insufficiently identified. But uh, when we look closely at these sequences, what we find is that these are species of Lacaria uh, and, uh, and uh, I think Tricholoma, uh, but I, I'm still working on those identifications. So using Metacoder, we can begin to contrast the plantation versus native sites and begin to identify a list of fungi that appear to benefit from planting of pines and other fungi which may actually decrease in abundance. Uh, if we do the same comparison for plantation versus the wilding pines, we find another species emerged, particularly Clavulina, and that was a, a, a a novel result from this survey that suggests that Clavulina is particularly enriched and may be a facilitator of invasive pines uh, in this particular system. So to summarize the metagenomics results, <clears throat> we know that, that a pine forest can support hundreds of mycorrhizal fungi. But when, when it gets down to it, it's just a handful of species that are associated with pine plantation, exotic pine, pine plantations. The ones shown in uh, dark green here are the ones that consistently emerge uh, include in the uh, pine plantations as well as in the uh, uh, invasive sites. <clears throat> the other species shown in, uh, in lighter green are also consistently uh, observed. And uh, in most cases, 
we observe just a single taxon, just a single species representing uh, what can be sometimes be a rather large genus. So one question that we want to ask here is, <clears throat> why is it always just one species? Uh, and this, what this also suggests is that, that there is a requirement here for phylogenetic diversity. So uh, we don't just see one genus, Suillus or Rhizopogon, we see uh, several genera uh, coexisting and co-occurring in association with these exotic pines. Uh, so if, if you go back not too far, uh, people have tried to, to uh, look at the diversity. And in fact, it's not surprising here, Dun uh, Bill Dunstan in 1998 published a paper uh, where they reported 11 species uh, that they were able to identify using morphology. In fact, all of these are species that we've been able to identify in our survey. The only one that we didn't find was Cenococcum. And um, I'm not sure, but I think Cenococcum may be missing, uh, a missing element of, of this particular community. Uh, Dunstan also tried to come up with some explanations uh, for why we see varying distributions of these different fungi. And I've mentioned some of these factors. For example, the period of time since European colonization, uh, various trade routes and trade sources, frequency of visitation, uh, proximity uh, to other potential sources of pine-associated fungi, and of course, the uh, unique attributes of several species that make them able to survive with exotic pines. So I'm gonna summarize here again. Uh, we have a scenario where a single pine tree can be associated with dozens of different mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, but what we find in, in actuality is that it's just a handful of these fungi that seem to be consistently able to associate with exotic pines and invading pines. And so uh, one, one uh, sort of begging question is, what are the traits of these fungi? Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, just throw out a quick teaser here. This is some, some recent data uh, generated by uh, uh, Jenny Botnagar's lab and her grad student, Corinne Vitores, uh, where they looked at uh, the soil biogeochemistry of these sites. And this is a, just a summary slide here, but <clears throat> what you can see here is that the uh, plantation forests shown here in green uh, consistently have higher uh, carbon uh, Available, available in their soils. Uh, and the invasives uh, are also slightly different from the uh, native forest, the native eucalypt forest. Uh, if we look at nitrogen, similar variation. Uh, and for contrast, uh, we obtain soils uh, collected by uh, Sunny Lau and, and Coco Chen. Uh, these soils were collected under native pine radiata pine forests in California. And so you can see uh, for both nitrogen and carbon, native uh, pine forests have, have uh, higher carbon and nitrogen content. However, uh, their carbon nitrogen ratios are actually lower than the uh, uh, soils uh, from the exotic plantations in Australia. So, so what we're seeing here is that there are some uh, lingering effects on the soil biogeochemistry that result from these plantation forests. And, uh, and one of the questions we're trying to address now is what species of ectomycorrhizal fungi might be contributing to these changes? Okay, I wanna talk uh, last about uh, a study that's also ongoing. This is uh, the subject of my uh, grad student, Yi Hong Ki's PhD thesis. So I'll give uh, Yi Hong all the credit here. Uh, but we wanted to look at the population structure of some of these species that have been widely introduced and ask how have their population structures 
uh, changed or responded to, to this uh, association with exotic forestry. We're looking at uh, demographic history, mating systems, and ultimately at molecular basis of adaptation. So the slippery jack, Suillus luteus, is probably the most commonly reported Suillus species with pines around the world, uh, wherever exotic pines have been introduced. We know that it's likely to have originated in Europe, uh, but and uh, and we know that these uh, radiata forests have been introduced all over the world. Uh, Suillus luteus in particular has been fingered uh, numerous times as a key fungus which facilitates uh, invasion by pines, especially in South America and in, uh, in uh, New Zealand. Uh, and in some cases, the dispersal of these suilloid fungi is assisted by other introduced exotic mammals, such as deers and boars, uh, leading to a complete invasional meltdown uh, in these, in these uh, forest systems. Uh, we also know that Suillus is a highly adaptive fungus, uh, particularly on uh, soils that are polluted with heavy metals and uh, otherwise stressful habitat. So obviously able to facilitate uh, the growth of pines. And of course we have genome sequences for Suilloid fungi. So JGI is uh, a, a, a high quality draft of the Suillus ge uh, luteus genome. And uh, with Yihong, we've uh, submitted over 150 samples now for either from fruiting bodies or cultures of Suilloid, of Suillus luteus samples uh, that we've obtained uh, from every continent. Uh, and uh, even Africa, I don't have a data point here, although uh, that's an interesting case. Uh, so the question here is where are these exotic luteus populations coming from? And uh, is there any evidence for admixture uh, during in the course of introduction? So long story short, here's a phylogeny based on SNPs uh, for, for the uh, samples that we had as of last year. And as you can see here, very, uh, it's shown in black, first of all, is the, the parental or source population. Uh, in this case, these are all originated from, uh, from Belgium, but we've, we've got sampling now from all over Europe. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, the Australian samples that we have form a separate lineage from uh, New Zealand samples, although they, uh, they share a common, common uh, root uh, in this tree. Uh, South American samples, appear to be uh, also a distinct, very unique origin. Uh, in contrast, uh, the few North American samples shown here uh, are virtually identical uh, to their uh, European counterparts. So we can use a variety of different analyses, uh, principal component analysis and so forth, and uh, begin to look at at least how many uh, lineages or independent trajectories one can observe here. So here's one, one of these, uh, and I'll sh start here first of all with uh, European populations, the source in red, and you can see overlaid on top of those, the uh, North American uh, genotypes are virtually identical. Uh, and that's consistent with the relatively recent introduction of Pinus sylvestris and other European pines to North America uh, co, uh, and co-introduction of Suillus luteus uh, from those sources. Um, but what you see here is that the New Zealand populations are also very similar to, although distinct from the uh, European population and that these form uh, a similar trajectory uh, that leads to the Australian fungi. So it's very possible here that New Zealand and Australian uh, populations of luteus have been uh, maybe part of the same uh, introduction or same original introduction uh, 
I'll show them here. And then finally, the South American, this blue cluster here uh, represents uh, uh, largely Chilean and Argentinian populations, which uh, is quite puzzling, but uh, appear to have a, a completely separate and unique origin uh, and no obvious connection to the European population, although uh, we've, we've, we've sampled a little bit more here from South America, so we will see how that works out. Anyway, uh, we start seeing evidence for population structure and divergent uh, histories in these different lineages. Uh, if we do uh, additional analyses, such as uh, using structure, the, the program structure here, uh, we can begin to sort uh, the populations into uh, at least uh, uh, four or five discrete lineages corresponding again to the European population shown here in yellow. Uh, based on this analysis, the New Zealand populations are clearly derived from the European population. Uh, the uh, South American populations represent a unique genetically unique group, subgroup, as do uh, the uh, Australian groups, although there's some admixture here. And you can see th that uh, the most discrete group here is this Asiatic population. And uh, we've got more samples now from uh, Taiwan and uh, Eastern Asia, but uh, we believe that there's a, uh, a, a, a separate subpopulation of Suilus luteus uh, that occurs in Asia and, and also possibly in Northern Europe as well. So uh, what are the sources of these introductions? We know that there are multiple independent introductions on every continent. Uh, North American uh, populations very likely came from Europe, the New Zealand ones as well, <coughs> the uh, Australian. Uh, the Argentinian and Chilean populations are very likely to have originated from Europe, but we're still trying to identify uh, the likely source population for those. So we, in addition, we see different levels of admixture that suggest that in fact, some of these populations may still be mating amongst themselves. Uh, Yi Hong has also looked at uh, the demographic history of these different populations. We know that uh, European populations must have experienced quater quaternary uh, uh, ice ages uh, and contractions in, in the range of pine species followed by recent uh, reinvasion re of pines into Europe. Uh, and of course, we know that many of these other uh, introductions and invasions are much more recent. So we're using statistics such as Tsujima's D here and other models to try to infer uh, how much genetic diversity has been uh, introduced and how much of it has been lost through, uh, through sampling effects, through uh, bottlenecks. And as you can see here, uh, the, uh, the, Bel the single Belgian population here has the highest theta and nucleotide diversity levels, uh, but they're not really that much higher than uh, the levels we observe for New Zealand, for example. Australia uh, probably shows the, the greatest reduction in genetic diversity that you might predict as a result of uh, a genetic bottleneck. And uh, Tajima's D statistic, which basically uh, uh, tries to estimate what the uh, sort of null expectation might be uh, if there was uh, uh, a constant population size. Uh, this statistic suggests that in fact, uh, uh, positive to Gima's D for the, all of the exotic populations suggests that they've all uh, have lost many of their rare alleles during uh, recent genetic bottlenecks. Uh, in contrast, a negative to Gima's D here uh, for the European population suggests that in fact, those populations may have undergone rapid population expansion, uh, possibly during uh, or since the ice ages. So, so most of the introduced populations still have high nucleotide diversity. Uh, 
So genetic bottlenecks probably have not had too much effect on genetic diversity. That's an interesting observation. Uh, and we wanna know, uh, you know, what are the uh, signatures of recent population, recent and, and ancient population uh, uh, expansions. So uh, we can also look at the mating systems of these fungi. And, and uh, we know a little bit about the mating uh, system of Suillus. Uh, we know that it has a mating incompatibility system uh, whereby uh, different alleles are maintained uh, and rare alleles have a strong advantage uh, due to uh, uh, overdominant selection or balancing selection. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we, we predict that in fact, maybe this retention or ability to maintain uh, high genetic diversity is probably a result of the mating system in these fungi. Uh, but we also know that in other invasive plant species and other fungi, selfing may also be an adaptive trait. And so the question here is, does Suillus luteus ever exhibit uh, selfing mating between sib spores, such as you might expect when, when there's been a, an extreme genetic bottleneck. And so uh, we're, uh, this is what Baker called the ideal weed. And uh, in many plant species, uh, selfing is a, a strategy to assure uh, reproductive, uh, uh, reproductive assurance. Okay, so we, uh, we looked at the mating genes. Uh, we've uh, and we want to ask, does Suillus luteus exhibit higher rates of selfing or other type of asexual-like reproduction? So Yi Hong has, uh, has been looking at the mating alleles at the HD locus, or, uh, which is the uh, mat A locus in Suillus. Um, and uh, when we compare these genes, he's uh, reconstructed uh, the mating allele uh, haplotypes uh, for several of these populations. And what we see is the same thing. We see lots of diversity. So here's uh, the haplotypes that were reconstructed for five individuals. Uh, all of the individuals are heterozygous at their mat locus, as expected. And in the sample of five individuals, we find seven unique mating alleles. So that's high, high diversity. The mating locus here appears to be working as designed. High nucleotide diversity, uh, suggesting that the locus is highly functional and is under strong balancing selection. So what about selfing and uh, heterozygosity? So uh, of course, if you take an individual, if you take spores from that individual and self them, uh, you lose half the heterozygosity through self-mating. So do we see any evidence for higher selfing rates in these populations? And here, we're gonna compare the levels of heterozygosity across different genome samples from Australia, Europe, North America, New Zealand, South America, and Asia. And as you can see here, uh, you, know, you can see that most of these populations have relatively the same heterozygosity. Australia is a little bit lower, but down here you see two points. Uh, these two genotypes have roughly half the heterozygosity of the rest of the population from which they, where they occur. And uh, if we look at these, uh, we actually have the mushrooms that these came from. And as you can see here, uh, these are both occurring in, uh, in relatively isolated parts of, of New Zealand. So uh, uh, this one in particular here uh, was fruiting under a single pine tree that's uh, more than uh, 50 kilometers away from the nearest other pine plantation in New Zealand. So, so it's probably been there a while and, uh, and probably doesn't have much opportunity to mate with other uh, fungi than, than with itself. Um, the other genotype here is from another uh, plantation forest that you see here. So uh, we see evidence for selfing, and I think this is the first evidence of selfing 
in naturally occurring fun basidiomycete fungi that I'm aware of. Uh, now there's a couple of data points that are relatively high. And so these are, oh, I'm sorry, did I jump out of sequence here? Yeah, let me just jump back here. Uh, so some of these other strains with high heterozygosity, uh, uh, these may actually represent strains that have crossed uh, back to the original parental source population. So these are, are super heterozygous or hyper heterozygous. And then finally, in, within the European population, uh, some of our cultures uh, also had reduced heterozygosity. And we believe that these may, may actually represent haploid or monokaryotic strains of Suillus luteus. And we don't know where they, how they got that way, but we suspect that, that they may have actually lost one of their nuclei uh, as a result of uh, long-term serial culturing. So the, to, just to conclude here, uh, we know that mating behavior can change, but it doesn't usually change very much in these isolated populations. We know that mating locus diversity uh, is still high. Uh, we don't see no loss of function. Uh, we did observe some F1 selfing uh, in some of the, uh, but only in a few isolated subpopulations. Uh, evidence for super heterozygotes uh, suggests that hybridization does occur between diverging populations. Uh, and that su also su suggests that the, the mating locus is fully functional. Uh, and then finally, these haploid strains from Europe, we don't know what their origins are, but one possibility is that they may actually represent uh, a form of homothallic fruiting. And uh, that's something that Sarah Branco and our European collaborators are exploring. So I'm just gonna summarize here. Uh, first of all, we can begin to trace the uh, geographic origins of these exotic fungal introductions using ITS sequencing. In some cases, uh, it's not difficult because there's only one species that's been introduced from many different genera of EMF fungi. Uh, we see strong evidence for ecological filtering, which seems to favor the uh, fungi that can survive desiccation. Maybe they are part of the spore bank that's been introduced. Uh, as well as different nursery practices. Uh, we see evidence for, for uh, also, as we look at the biogeography of some of these species, we see evidence for, for host shifting or, uh, or maintenance of host specificity, such as the case of the California associated uh, EM fungi introduced with radiata pine. Uh, even though these pine communities are greatly impoverished, uh, these EM communities, we still see multiple phylogenetically diverse fungi present, uh, which suggests very strongly that there is uh, a strong pattern or some strong element of uh, functional uh, diversity uh, uh, in these different fungi. Uh, we see evidence for both uh, single and multiple introductions, uh, but in many cases we see a single highly adaptable fungal species being introduced and spread. And uh, a major question that remains is what are the traits that allow these fungi to become uh, super spreaders the way they are? Uh, we see evidence for displacement of some of the native ectomycorrhizal fungi uh, in particular. Uh, but it's not, it's not, doesn't appear to be, uh, you know, a, a major problem. The, the, commu the microbial communities are still largely intact. Uh, and that we see evidence for genetic changes in a relatively short time. And, uh, and as well as uh, sort of the ecological legacy, we see evidence for changes in, in the soil chemistry where these fungi have been introduced with their plant hosts. So I'm, I'm gonna summarize, uh, just say thank you for your attention. I have way too many people to acknowledge here.
uh, and some of you may recognize yourselves in these photos. Uh, but these are the uh, people who study fungi down under for the most part. Uh, so I'd like to just say thank you and, uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to participate in the uh, 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 White Taylor lecture series. Thank you. I'd like to thank you very much, Ritas, for a very stimulating talk. And anyone who has questions, um, put them into the chat and Joanne will um, uh, enable people to ask their question. Great, uh, Eduardo, if you're here, you have the first question. Yeah, nice talk, I really enjoyed that. Um, so you were talking about different, like different species that you found in Australia. And um, I was thinking like uh, why some, like even when those belong to the same genus, Willis, I wonder uh, why some species are more likely to become uh, invasive rather than others. And if I'm, I don't know, I, I just had a, a discussion based on Kabir's last, well, not last paper, but the 2020 about the symbiotic niche. And uh, so I wonder if you can like map that symbiotic niche with several Swiss species so that you might predict based on bioassays which Swiss species have a broader niche and those would be like the most likely to become invasive in Australia. So, and also for Clavulina because uh, that, that's a really interesting genus as well. Yeah, I think the, the, the Clavulina uh, results just jumped out at us because we certainly, uh, we, you know, we didn't expect it, but I think that that was before people were using, uh, you know, applicon sequencing. And I think, I think I've seen it before. So Clavulina rugosa is very common European species. It seems to have been uh, widely introduced with pines, but yeah, I think Suillus and Rhizopogon are interesting because those, first of all, they're early successional species. In fact, you can't even start a pine plantation, you know, growing pines without one or the other. Uh, and, and they persist, although they, they're, they don't seem to be as important as the pine plantate, as the pines get larger. And uh, so a good question is, yeah, why Suillus luteus? I mean, Suillus luteus and granulatus are, are by far the most widely reported Suillus species. Uh, now, Suillus bovinus, is a good good example. That one's you f you find it, but it's not never as common, and it never seems to be abundant uh, in these plantations. So you know, is that a, a sort of a does that suggest that it's less competitive? Um, we we have done some experiments. We did some experiments where we uh, co inoculated with Suillus quiescens from California and Suillus luteus, and I can tell you that. They they both behave very differently on different hosts, so that there's there's a strong host driven element here, and I think it's not it's probably not an accident that that radi first of all radiata pine has emerged as the the number one uh, plantation species in Australia and New Zealand, but uh, in other countries they've abandoned radiata pines for various reasons, including the fact that they become invasive. And, and uh, by switching to other pine hosts, they, they've acquired, they seem to have acquired other Suillus fungi associated with those other pines. So there's probably some host tracking going on uh, in the case of Suillus, uh, uh, which is interesting because uh, other fungi like Lacaria, we weren't expecting that that we would find uh, recruitment. But I think that Lacaria and Cortinarius especially uh, are both getting recruited uh, from, from the native forests. Great, it looks like Alan hopped off. So Tom Bruns, if you'd like to ask your question. Oh, uh, great talk, Rita. <laughs> it's, a, it's just a cool story about the co-invasion and so on. Um, <clears throat> The uh, evidence for selfing, it, occur it occurs to me that that should be indistinguishable from just a 
a, a founder event that if you have a very small set of genotypes that hit that one pine or whatever, and then made it among themselves over over multiple generations, just because they're the only ones available, that you ought to also get a reduction in heterozygosity. Um, yeah. And that that's it's not a it's not a reproductive strategy. Uh, yeah, that's what that's, that's what I'm going for. Is that it could be more of a population consequence than a than a reproductive yeah. strategy. Um, Although it, it could be the, the former as well, because uh, you know they can package sort of pre-mated spores and send those out. Do you so? Do you see a reduction in the number of mating alleles? No, no, I don't. Uh, so we, you know, we haven't worked up the full data set, but but we're not seeing that. We're seeing lots of mating allele diversity and. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I will have to look at the uh, genetic structure of the mating alleles once we have them all assembled. Uh, John, did you want to ask your other question too? I think I think Eduardo basically asked it. I I know Ritas in the in in other work with North American uh, Swillis has shown that um, that the pair of mushroom and pine that come from nature can be better adapted. And when he's, he's experimentally put Swillis with other hosts and actually looked at transcriptomics of that and, and seeing that some Swillis are, are sort of universal donors, they can work with a lot of pines and some are really um, specific. And so I wondered like Eduardo, if there was some difference in the ones that are able to go to other continents, are they the more the generalists or not? Yeah, it's it's a good question because I mean, if you give given enough time, uh, it's it seems like a lot of these fungi can can adapt to different hosts, and we know that that uh, from the phylogenetic analyses of each genus that they have switched hosts a lot. So it's not like, but but there are certain groups of uh, pine pineaceae such as larches uh, that have very unique set of Suiloid fungi, and they don't they don't jump around as much. Uh, we have a couple more minutes. We'll stay until one fifteen. There's a question from Chen Gao. If you're here, you want to hop on and ask. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, very good uh, talk. Uh, my question is: uh, We see the. Uh, 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 the mushroom, uh, the, the fungi associated with pine uh, in Australia. So do we uh, also see the fungi that are associated with plant from Australia in the, uh, like in the Europe or in the uh, America? Yes, yeah. that's 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 a good question because yes, the same process. You know, you know, we've we've exported pines across the southern southern hemisphere and. And the Australians have exported eucalyptus and other myrtaceae uh, all over the Mediterranean regions of the world, including California. Uh, and there is a core set of EM fungi that have, that travel with eucalyptus, you know. Uh, but it's not it's not as large a set of fungi as as the pines carry with them. Uh, yeah. They're, okay. They're, thank you. Great, and we have one question from Mary Wildermuth, if you're here, Mary. Yeah, hi, um, great talk. My question has to do with, um, you had mentioned the possibility of asexual reproduction versus the homothallic fruiting, and I was wondering if you could comment more about that. Well, I work on powdery mildew, so <laughs> used yeah. to thinking about asexual reproduction. Well, it, at least for the basidiomycete fungi that we're working with, most of them are, uh, are don't, really exhibit much asexual reproduction. It's, I mean, that's, I think that that uh, it's possible that they could. I mean, obviously in basidiomycetes and, and ascomycetes, there's a lot of uh, amectic uh, fungi uh, and haploid fruiting does occur. So, you know, we were surprised, you know, when the uh, sort of genome data pointed at a bunch of the, uh, it was just one, about 20 cultures that came from Belgium 
that were all haploid. And, uh, you know, they just don't have any SNP variation within those genomes. And uh, we, you know, we thought, well, it's possible that they, they could have been produced by, uh, by asexual fruiting, just homothallic fruiting. But I don't think that's the case. Because, uh, you know, having worked with basidiomycetes for, for many years, it's not uncommon for a strain to become spontaneously haploid again, just, mm -hmm. you know, through sectoring or some other. Well, as you alluded, it seems like um, there should be signatures in the genome, right? If it was asexual versus sexual. Well, we should see lots of clones. And right, we don't, exactly. And we don't see clones. Okay. So, but that's, there are other, you know, plenty of other fungi that have lots of clonality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, thank you. So that takes us to about 1.15. I'm going to stop the recording.